Old School Lane Casual Chats is brought to you by OldSchoolLane.blogspot.com and is associated with Channel Frederator, Manic Expression, The Comic Book Cast, and The Araminta Show. Hello everyone, welcome to a brand new episode of Casual Chats. I am Patricia and I am back with uh, Chris aka Rowdy C. Welcome back Chris. Yo and hello! So about roughly six months ago we discussed about the Disney Golden Era in honor of Snow White's anniversary. So this time around we're actually going to be discussing about something else related to Disney that most people don't really look back on fondly depending on which uh, movie that you're talking about. We're talking about movies based off of Disney Toon Studios, or Disney Movie Studios as it was originally called. Uh, the reason why we're talking about this is because it recently shut down after being around for almost 30 years. And um, I'm sure for some people who are wondering what Disney, Stu Disney Toon Studios was known for, they were known for their direct-to-video movies. And I know that I've gotten a ton of requests for my thoughts on what some of the direct-to-video movies based off of uh, Disney's most iconic and classic movies were. So now it's that time, and I'm bringing Chris with me because I can't do this by myself. Well, absolutely. I think, I think both of us are people that we really grew up when, the, when Disney became rather infamous for releasing a lot of these movies. It was around the time where... I guess because of their cheap production and the name brand recognition, they were one of the few um, entities of Disney's that was actually turning out a profit for them in a time when the company had really be began to struggle. So it, it was kind of almost like a necessary evil for a lot of these movies were. Yeah, definitely. I think that depending on what time period you're talking about, these movies were like the last inkling into... Um, Disney's um, reputation for delivering some of the best animated features for multiple generations, or at least trying to remind you of such. In a time in which, um, especially around the late 90s throughout the 2000s, when Pixar and DreamWorks were pretty much at the top of the line in doing you know, movies that catered towards kids and, and adults, Disney was kind of like towards the background. If if um, their theatrical movies were doing very well, then there would be a high chance that they would be doing a uh, straight-to-video or DVD movie based off of one of their old properties. I mean, the ironic thing was that when you really look at their history, at least two of the first three movies that this studio in particular released were released in theaters. Yes, they were. And I guess we might as well talk about the very first one that was released in theaters and their very first movie. Um, it is a movie based off of one of their TV shows. More specifically, it's DuckTales, the movie Treasure of the Lost Lamp. Yeah, I, w I actually reviewed this movie uh, a couple of weeks, a couple of years ago. It was done pretty much in tribute to uh, the late Alan Young, who voiced Scrooge McDuck for m many years, including voicing the character throughout the entire original DuckTales series. Yeah, this, was, this, was really, this was really a hope that Disney had made this one, this to be a turning point for them, is this was going to be the first of what they had hoped would be multiple um, theatrical released movies um, continuing from the Disney Afternoon shows. Unfortunately, um, the return on this movie in theaters was not enough for uh, for them to decide to continue on to this, which is sadly why we do not have a Darkwing Duck movie still to this day. But, you know, I, I remember watching this thing when it was first released in theaters, and to be perfectly honest, it, it kind of gets underappreciated, to be perfectly fair. I mean, this was this was one area where they didn't script that much on the animated quality, or, or the voice talent, definitely. All of the original voice actors were present, along with bringing in, you know, the likes of Christopher Lloyd to voice the villain for this particular feature. You know, I really felt the storyline fit perfectly the, the entire concept of the of the series and of Scrooge McDuck's character and how and, and the multiple 
sides of his personality and how he has to has, has always had to find a way to corral in you know his miser like um, personality to do what's best for everyone else, which he usually always is able to come up with in the end either way. I, I, I would still recommend anyone that hasn't needs to check out this movie because I think it's it's not technically I don't think it was the conclusion of the DuckTales series. I'm pretty sure a few more episodes were produced after it, but it really is a very welcome addition to anyone who has a history with the Disney afternoon. Yeah, pretty much. And yeah, even though that DuckTales, it did end around 1990, there were still a few more episodes that did air on um you know on the disney on, on the disney channel uh the movie came out in august and the series ended in november so we cannot officially confirm that this was supposed to be like a series finale for ducktales but nonetheless uh for those who don't know what the movie is about uh, the movie is about scrooge and the gang and they're going over to the middle east to find the lost lamp of Col- uh, the lost treasure of kali baba and um, along the way, they have this um, this guide by the name of Dijon, who is actually working for the bad guy named Mur- uh, Murloc. And he wants to find a talisman so that he can be able to find the lamp and he can be able to make unlimited wishes. Because but he has the talisman in his possession. Oh, that's right. Yeah, he does. No, he was the lamp. That's what I meant to say. He's always been unable to find the lamp, but has relied, but has trusted, and more or less tr- trusted on following Scrooge into locating it because, of course, Scrooge has long had the history of pretty much the world's greatest treasure hunter. It's how he amassed his entire fortune, more or less. Yeah, pretty much. So, yeah, if anybody had watched the TV series or played the NES game, then you probably already know about Scrooge's reputation of being a well-known treasure hunter. So, um, yeah, the kids end up getting the lamp and they meet up with the genie and they grant and he grants them like a whole bunch of wishes and Scrooge doesn't know that um there is a genie until much later on when he wants to present him over to um you know his um his group or his uh, particular club and then that's yeah, he when wants, he wants you he wants the genie to help him basically he lost the treasure in the process with only the lamp being only recovering the lamp in the process since he had given it to Webby anyway. But of course, the lamp is the only thing Murloc is interested in, so the treasure would just cast aside. Uh, What Scrooge does is the first wish he has once he gets hold of the lamp is to wish for the treasure back, which is is what he's always been, yeah, his society of treasure hunters or whatnot is. I'm, I'm ashamed that I don't remember what the name of it is. But yeah, he's always been wanting to prove them that he would eventually find that treasure. So eventually he has to um, relate, relate, um, has to, uh, oh, the full word is escaping me here. He has to rely on the genie to help more or less recover the treasure that he had originally found. It's, it's kind of a loophole thing going there. Yeah. And um, one thing that I'm really um, interested of when it comes to the, when many people's critiques of this movie was that they always compared the genie to the genie from Aladdin, which... I guess I could kind of understand because they're kind of like whimsical, fun genies, but uh, the genie from DuckTales was featured two years before Aladdin. But yeah, the, I guess maybe because, uh, you know, Robin Williams did such a great job as the genie that the genie from DuckTales pretty much just got pushed to the side, which we'll discuss about later when we talk about the Aladdin sequels. Right, exactly. It's- they were basically the first two. But this was, one, I guess, one of the very first movies that really started to portray a, a genies as kind of more of a sympathetic character. You have to remember, up to this point, a lot of stories from the Arabian Nights involving the jinn and genies and whatnot is that they were always supposed to be evil tricksters in disguise. They were meant to, ultimately, like that they were technically supposed to be in service to whoever possessed their lamp. But they were, they were always looking to um, look, looking to double cross you and basically in, in more or less create a be careful what you wish for type of situation. This was one of the first movies where it, it, it started to portray them as people who had, had done so basically just because they had been tired of centuries of servitude and present them as a character that we would want to see be released from that bond in the end, which is ultimately what happens at the conclusion of 
this story and of course what happened in the conclusion of the first theatrical Disney's Aladdin that as you point out was released a little more than two years later right but overall, um, I think that the climax in the movie is really well done, and it gets really suspenseful when Murloc eventually gets this, the, um, the lamp and he puts his talisman on it so he can get unlimited wishes, and he pretty much just, like, takes over the world. And then, you know, we have that battle with Scrooge and the, um, the rest of the gang trying to grab the lamp from Murloc and trying to be able to, you know, um, make the wish to have everything get back to normal. And then, of course, you know, that funny ending in which G Dijon basically took every single bit of gold from Scrooge's vault and stuffed it in his pants and ran away. No, not all of it, but enough that, yeah, that was a, the whole running gag. Of the of the you know, being able to is to stuff everything in his pants. It's like it's it's like every person every every gat time Nash has had to talk about some idiot like that on his show. It's like did this person watch this movie or something? Did right. they get that idea from watching this movie? <laughs> but but yeah, definitely. I, I said if I, I'm gonna I'm gonna just yeah show my own plug here that if you want to catch more of my in detailed um views of this movie you definitely look it up look it up in the tv trash archives on rowdyc.com which i did review this movie in full detail all right that's fine so overall i do think that ducktales the movie is still a pretty decent movie and a you know a good movie to um branch out from the tv series uh, oh yeah, it definitely I agree with you, Chris. That not a lot of people really bring this movie up when it comes to Ducktales. They you know they discuss about either the TV series or the characters, but not really much the movie. And I think that's a shame. Yeah, I mean obviously there was some disappointments. The fact that you know none of perhaps none of Scrooge's Rogues Gallery takes part in this um, in this movie as far as the Beagle Boys or Glomgold or Magica. So that, may, that might be a bit of a detriment to some people, but yeah, overall it really was, uh, you know, I think it was about as epic of a storyline as they could create for a theatrically released uh, movie based on this series. And yeah, definitely I think it uh, deserves more appreciation than it gets. For, the, for what it's worth, this was not a bad start for what would eventually become Disney Toon Studios. Right, right. And I'm actually really curious if the new DuckTales TV series about what their movie would look like, if it ever does happen. We'll have to we'll just wait and see on that. Yeah. All right, now let's go over to The Return of Jafar. Now, from what I heard, originally they wanted to do this theatrically, but I think that due to various constraints that they decided to make it into a... Um, uh, you know, straight to video movie, and this was this is essentially a pilot uh, uh, to the Aladdin TV series that would come out shortly after this movie came out. Exactly. This and I and I will frankly admit, look, I grew up growing. So many so many has grew up on the Disney Renaissance. Aladdin was and perhaps still remains one, perhaps my favorite movie of all time. So when I had when, when I heard about that this was it was being continued in the direct to video movies and the TV series, I, I, I was hooked on it from the beginning. And what watching this one overall, again, this is this really wasn't a bad start for them to get off of, into this. It does a, a very decent job continuing the storyline, and in a way, the, the first movie did kind of end on the type of I wouldn't say it ended on a cliffhanger, but it did have an ending that made it look like there could be more to this story being told, to be perfectly honest. And I think that's why they more or less took advantage of it and the the movie's intense popularity to use this as the stepping stone to start creating these types of sequel films. Right. And, yeah, and it introduced us to a major villain that would be featured a lot in the TV series, Abismal. And we would have um, m many villains featured in the TV series later on. And we have Jafar back, and, you know, he's once again played by um, Jonathan Freeman. And, um, interestingly enough, he also plays him in the Aladdin Broadway show, which I thought was actually pretty cool that they were able to bring him back there. But... 
Um, but I'm sure for a lot of people, they already know about this fact that the genie is not voiced by Robin Williams. He's vo voiced by Dan Castellaneta. And it was due to um, a sort of fib in Disney's part about how, you know, they were going to pay him in, you know, they were going to pay him like less than scale, like normally. Well, yeah, the whole difference was, yeah, Williams agreed, to, yeah, agreed to take scale pay for this movie as a tribute because he w wanted to appear in a Disney film for his daughter. And the trade-off for that was, was that they, they more or less had a gentleman's agreement, so to speak, that they weren't going to excessively use his presence in the movie as a promotional standpoint, especially because I think he had some other movie project he was working on at the same time. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, Jeffrey Katzenberg uh, kind of went backed out of that agreement, and, and his presence was heavily hyped, and yeah, because of that, Williams did walk away from Disney and was did not take part in either this movie or the television series that immediately followed it. Right, but he would take play. He would take part in the um, the third movie, but that's pretty much it. After that, Dan Castellaneta pretty much took over for both the TV series and for all the Kingdom Hearts games. So, yeah, uh, the, I think that I know a lot of people give crap for this movie because, you know, for a follow up to Aladdin, they expected it to be like gigantic because, you know, it's a movie that a lot of people love. It had action, it had romance, it had comedy, and they expected the same thing from the sequel. But I think when you understand about what this movie is actually supposed to be, that is technically supposed to be a pilot to the TV series, then I don't really like despise it like everybody else seems to do. I think one issue they might have is that when you really look at it, it's almost not Aladdin's story or even Jasmine's or even Genie's. It's essentially Iago's story. Is me because we because I'm sure anyone who has watched this knows that this is more or less yeah the move the set the central theme of the movie is Iago's face turn. Sorry for anyone who doesn't know wrestling jargon for me is it, it's uh, unearthing that, but he basically transforms, not completely a good guy, but he does break away from Jafar and becomes the one, the one who ultimately is able to destroy him in the end and earns some kind of trust between Aladdin, Jasmine, and their friends. Right. And also, I, I mean, I don't have any issues with the animation because I know it's a directed video movie and it's, it, it is, like, going to be really low budget. Uh, I just don't... The songs are just, like, not that good. I mean, when you consider that Aladdin had, like, really memorable songs in the original, trying to get into uh, from that movie to this, it's definitely very subpar. Definitely not very memorable to me. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I think that um, you know when you understand where what this movie is supposed to be, um, I guess you know it doesn't deserve that much of a hate. I mean, yes, the stakes are a little bit lower than the original. The animation's a little bit poorer, and the the story structure is supposed to be pa is paced out like you know a TV movie. But other than yeah, but that's I mean that's to be expected, I guess, and I guess that's why a lot of people really critiqued it when it first came out. I think that more people understand on um, what it is. And from what it is, it's okay. It's not terrible. Trust me, there's a lot worse movies down the line. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, so let's go over to the second uh, theatrical movie. And I guess, you know, this is probably going to be the last one that they try to make a TV, uh, like a movie based off of their... Um, their animated series, which is a Goofy movie, which I guess it's kind of like an unofficial follow-up to Goof Troop, but it's kind of different because, you know, for example, Pete doesn't have his wife and daughter with him. It just only has PJ. And there's some characters that were never showcased in the series that are in the movie. And, um, you know, Max is portrayed a lot older, which I guess it's understandable because Dana Hill, the original voice of Max, had passed away. And that this is the first time in which we hear Jason Marsden play as Max. And from what they had to do, the story is actually really good. And a lot of people seem to fondly remember this one. Yeah, this I'm going to confess, this is one movie where... I've only seen it in parts. I don't think I've ever seen this one 
in its exact full run time. Yeah, it, it's definitely a situation where it's almost like the, the, they want to consider it might be connected to Goof Troop, but maybe not. It's, it, it's a strange issue where it could stand on its own either way, and maybe in that sense is one of the reasons why it ended up succeeding a little bit better than the DuckTales movie. It, it, it definitely does go further into... I mean, I'll say, when, when I look at uh, Goof Troop, the original TV series, it's it definitely has, uh, like, a 1990s family sitcom feel. It's kind of got that home improvement, Simpsons, married with children style to it within Disney's own parameters. This movie more or less comes off as trying to really... Uh, Focus, especially because Goof, like, like even as you know, a certain other critic, as mentioned before, the really almost the real source of the comedy and entertainment of the Goof Troop series was yeah focused on Pete's family. Pete's family. Oh, they were the one that had most of the really funny shenanigans. This movie really does seem to focus specifically more on the relationship between. Goofy and Max, and it, it, and it really, I think that that's where all the whole aging Max works out better anyway, because it, it puts Max at an age where, when you have some have a father um, like Goofy and kind of the shenanigans he's known for, he, he, as a teenager maybe you can feel a little bit embarrassed about it, but you're ha- ultimately having to confront that this is still someone who does care for you and has done everything he can to help make your life better and it, it's it really is kind of a coming of age bonding story that yeah i think a lot of people can find themselves identifying with yeah definitely and uh, another thing that i really do appreciate about this movie is that just like you said that it was able to not only stand on its own but the relationship between goofy and his son max it has a really nice father-son story that we wouldn't see until at least almost a decade later with finding nemo and i think that's why a lot of people now, you know, kind of like turn, you know, like have um, a close relationship towards this movie. And also, you know, you have the songs from Powerline, like Stand Out and Eye to Eye. And uh, then there's, you know, other songs like After Today and On the Road and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I think I remember listening to an, an episode of the Animated Anarchy podcast where um, they were talking about that um, a, a movie critic said that one of the downsides of a Goofy movie was that the soundtrack was not memorable, which I think that's pretty much turned uh, nowadays because there's this amazing YouTube video of um, a group of teenagers who are reenacting the scene from After Today, like with the bus and the high school kids and all that stuff. It's actually really good and well choreographed. And also, um, this was actually the very last movie that Pat Buttram voiced in right before he passed away. And, you know, he was a very well-known actor, both on television and in animation. In Disney, he has been voicing various characters since the 60s. He was Napoleon in Aristocats, the Sheriff of Nottingham from Robin Hood. Always, yeah, and of course, guys like me will always remember him as Mr. Haney from Green Acres. Right, exactly. So uh, I remember listening to Talking Tunes with Rob Paulson, where Billy Farmer, who was the voice of Goofy, talked about meeting up with Pat and when he was voicing a few lines for the movie and he was going over some skits uh, that he was going to say to this one actor or something like that. And it's actually pretty hilarious. If you guys haven't checked that episode out, you should. But yeah, I think that for the most part, uh, yeah, uh, I think that this movie succeeds better than Return of Jafar because you're right. Um, it does follow, uh, not, not Return of uh, DuckTales, DuckTales the movie. It's a, be- it's a much more better standalone movie than DuckTales because it doesn't really, f- you don't really have to see um, any episodes of Goof Troop in order for you to appreciate a Goofy movie. It, it does definitely stand out on its own, but at the same time, um, you know, it, it, I mean, if you're familiar with the characters, you know, you would really enjoy it. And it does really become much more different because in the TV series, Max was a little kid and, you know, it focuses on a lot more wacky shenanigans. But here is a lot uh, in Goofy movie. You appreciate the quieter moments like when uh, the scene in which when Pete, I mean, uh, when Max and Goofy are stranded in the car with Bigfoot um, roaming about and they're talking about alphabet soup or um, when... 
um, you have that scene in which when Pete ta- tells to talks to Goofy about how he's trying to change the course of the fishing trip so that they can be able to go to LA for the concert and just the, um, them trying to um, make amends when the car crashes and lands into the river and then they're trying to rescue each other from the waterfall. I mean, just I think that quiet moments like that is what makes this movie stand out. It's not just being like really loud and trying to be funny, it's also trying to be serious too. Absolutely. So uh, yeah, I think that's uh, pretty much all I have to say about that. Let's uh, go over to our next movie. So. Now we're going to talk about what is technically supposed to be like the series finale for the Aladdin TV series, and that's Aladdin and the King of Thieves. And yeah, this was pretty much for all intents. It's like, yeah, this was set up to be the conclusion because we finally get Aladdin and Jasmine's wedding. We get a number of issues about uh, Aladdin's own backstory cleared up. And, you know, for what it's worth, this does seem like as much of a best conclusion that I think they probably could go with for this series. Yeah, that is true. And and also, I'm I'm also really curious about some of the the music in here, especially like Out of Thin Air, where Aladdin is singing about like his past and not knowing too much about it. I'm actually curious about like, maybe this was supposed to um, be kind of like a spiritual successor to Proud of Your Boy, which is a song from the original that was never showcased in in, uh, in the soundtrack, but eventually did in the Broadway show about Aladdin singing about his mother. I'm actually curious about maybe um, maybe they, it's sort of like a, a follow up to it without being a follow up. This is uh, you know that's one of the issues that's it's always going to be speculation. We may never particularly know about that right that's true so from what i've heard in rumors originally the movie was supposed to showcase that one of the villains of um of the aladdin tv series uh, mosem wrath was aladdin's long lost brother but they decided to change it into that um the leader of the 40 thieves was in reality aladdin's father and that sean connery was supposed to voice him but due to um, him not being available, they instead put it into um, John Rice Davies, and um, I actually like the character of Kasim. It it definitely shows a very conflicting um, persona of him being the leader of the Forty Thieves, while him trying to also be a good father to Aladdin that he never got to be. Yeah, it's almost like you look at someone like Kasim. It's like obviously he had grown up a thief his entire life, but. And, and was never able to overcome that particular side of his life, which clearly Aladdin was able to do through one way or another. So I guess perhaps this was a guy, guy that ultimately w- wants to see Aladdin become the type of person and have the type of life he never could, while ultimately have in his own mind uh accepting the fact that he his time his chance to do that has passed him by like he which which we see in the end when you know he's able to see Aladdin finally get married to Jasmine before agreeing to walk off his own life with Iago in tow to just continuing the life of banditry that he has more or less resigned himself to 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 living yeah that's true. And I, and I think that's a really interesting ending. It's like he can't walk away from his past. It, it's kind of like stuck with him. And, you know, no matter how much he tries to be good, it's always going to crawl back to him. Which, you know, he almost tried to steal the scepter uh, throughout the middle of the movie so that he can be able to find the location of the Vanishing Isle. And he even said um, to Aladdin while he was getting arrested, you can change my clothes, Aladdin, you cannot change who I am. And, and it was apparent in the ending that he wasn't going to change you know, his ways, even though that he is no longer the leader of the 40 Thieves. And also that after, he find, after finding the hand of Midas, you know, what's there left to do? It's like it's his opportunity for him to go out and venture into new places. Perhaps very well, very likely. I mean, who knows? Maybe, you know, maybe there could have been like a spin-off series focusing on the two characters, but I guess at that point in time with this uh with everything that was going on, it's it's um it's a good thing that it ended the way it did. 
And also, you know, we have Robin Williams back as the genies, and, you know, he sounds as good as ever, but there's not really much of a purpose him being around f compared to the first movie. Yeah, again, this is another issue where obviously the genie was a very central figure in the original, but with his own individual conflict and goals having been resolved as much as anyone else's in that movie, he he does more or less just become he had, was a little more than the comic relief for the for the rest of the franchise, and and, and the stories um, do fo push more into trying to focus on other people's stories and conflicts. Yeah, very true. So yeah, um, and another thing that I really find found really interesting was that some of the members of the 40 Thieves were actually pretty interesting. Uh, obviously, Saluk, the guy who has like the Wolverine claws uh, with the, as a weapon, and you know him being incredibly ruthless to both Cassine and Aladdin, and doing everything that he can to, um, you know, find the hand of Midas. And the way that he dies is actually pretty brutal. Him turn into gold, it, it looked. It looks, I mean, I know it didn't hurt, I mean, like, in a sense in which you saw, like, blood or anything like that, but I cannot imagine just turning to gold from the inside out. It's it, it definitely something that, uh, it's definitely uh, something that might give some people nightmares, perhaps, in some one way or another. Yeah. But overall, like I said, yeah, like I said, the, 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 we're four movies into this franchise and into the series created by Disney Toon Studios, or as they were known as Disney Movie Tunes at this particular point in time. They took on the Disney Toons title around 2004, I believe. But really, you know, for all the flack they get, the first four movies at least were not all that bad. Now, they did focus on, like I said, they focused on more recent uh, productions. Nothing that had come out prior to the 1980s. And then we had, we had a, a continuation of the DuckTales story, a movie that was adapted from Goof Troop, and two films that were adapted from Aladdin. I, I'm going to confess that like, they, they got that, there's like at least, well, yeah, well more than 40 movies um, produced after this. And like I'm going to be the first to admit, I have not seen all of them, and not even all of the infamous sequel director video movies that that this fr the studio has been uh, mostly known for. Just um, just for uh, just a fair warning that there might not be that much I could talk about with m most of these movies. There are some that I have uh, at least if I haven't watched them. I've heard about them enough to know the gist of them. Yeah, I've seen at least a good a handful of them, but I haven't seen like more than half of these. So I'm pretty much in the same boat as you are that I'm not going to probably talk about, you know, every single one of them. So yeah, this might be a little bit shorter than what the list perceives to be. So sorry. Yeah, I can, t I can tell you these. I, I'm, I'm going over the list right now and I can pretty much tell you the movies that I, remaining movies that I have at least seen in their entirety was The Lion King 2, Simba's Pride, um, Return to Neverland, Cinderella 2, Jungle Book 2, and that, uh, and then maybe, uh, one or two of the, uh, of, of the Tinkerbell movies that came off at the very end. Now, now, there are some others that I get the, at least I get the gist of what the movies were about. And that was, that those would be Little Mermaid 2, Return to the Sea, Hunchback of Notre Dame 2, um, so you can see if there's any um, others here that I um, have. Beauty tracked. and the Beast Enchanted Christmas. I have I have seen, seen that that as well. Yes, that add that one as as well. Mm -hmm. And I think I may have. Um, I think I've seen bits and pieces of the Mickey's Christmas movies as well for okay. the most part. And, and yet I also have at least heard. Well, I haven't been able to see it yet. I have heard the, more or less the entire story of. Cinderella 3, A Twist in Time. Yeah. As well as Midcraft's Little Mermaid, Ariel's Beginning. I actually saw that one. I actually, and funny thing, I actually saw that movie on the train ride to meet up with you when we went to Disney World. Uh-huh. 
So yeah, uh, that's uh, if for anybody who actually saw the TV trash episode of the Little Mermaid animated series, we kind of did hint on um, you know uh, a person who has Ursula's backstory but was not really Ursula. It was essentially the character from Sin from the Little Mermaid Ariel's beginning. So I'll talk more about that later. Sure. Okay. So um, yeah, I've never seen Pooh's Grand Adventure: The Search for Christopher Robin. And have you seen it? No, no, I'll, I'll be first, but I don't think I've seen any of the uh, Winnie the Pooh movies of this series, which I'm kind of ashamed to do, since uh, back in theater school, one of my most favorite uh, pr performances was when I actually played Eeyore in a version of The House at Pooh Corner, in which everyone, not just myself, but everyone more or less agreed to portray the characters as the Disney versions. Ah. And that was... And, and, and that's why, you know, you bring up that, that, that trip to the Magic Kingdom we took. You know, that was why I had to get myself a picture with Eeyore at the diner. That was a lot that, of fun, actually, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so I'm kind of ashamed that I haven't watched those movies. Hopefully I won't get to catch the live-action Christopher Robin movie that's oh, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Later, this, later this summer. Yeah, I want to watch that for sure. Um, yeah, I've only seen one of these uh, Winnie the Pooh movies, and we'll talk about that one later. So uh, let's skip over to the Beauty and the Beast Enchanted Christmas. And uh, I remember I did own this movie on VHS because I really love the original so much. And um, yeah, it was one of those movies that I used to watch like every year for Christmas time. But then I got a little bit older and I kind of saw that it was not that great. I mean, you have... You know, the villain played by Tim Curry, which actually was pretty hilarious. But, yeah, it did seem like a pretty low-stake movie about, like... And, and, you know, instead of, you know, trying to get the Beast to fall in love right before the rose fell, it's a mid-quill, and it's about the Beast wanting to stop Christmas. It's... Uh... Yeah, yeah, this is, this is pretty much, the, the I think, the start of when people started to look at these direct-to-video movies and started to see... A noticeable lack of quality in them, and I, and I think obviously one of the definite flaws is, yeah, Beauty and the Beast was part of one movie that you you really can't follow up on it with a true sequel because really the the conflict, especially the internal conflict of the Beast in general, has been completely resolved by the end of that movie. So yeah, you almost anything that involves these characters. You gotta find, you gotta create a new story that somehow smat, smushed in between the, the storyline, somewhere in the middle of the whole storyline of the original movie, which does kind of handcuff you creatively in some levels. Yeah, that's true. And it's even worse in Belle's Magical World, which is essentially similar to Return of Jafar. It's supposed to be a pilot for a possible Beauty and the Beast TV series, but... They decided to cancel it, and whatever episodes that they wrote, they decided to cobble it together as four separate stories into a movie. And it shows. Yeah. It yeah. really shows. Yeah, and, they, they were, I, I, and look, trust, trust me, there's, there's some other... There, if there's one movie that I always thought would be deserving of maybe a mid-quill TV series, I would have actually gone with Sleeping Beauty, to be perfectly honest. I would have loved to have seen any type of series portraying... Aurora living as Briar Rose in the forest with the fairies. That would be could be a subject to think of some good comedy and adventure, but something where the where the story basically because like I said, there's a sixteen year window that's more or less not talked about at all within the storyline of that movie. You don't have that type of time span in Beauty and the Beast, so you just there's really not very there's really very few stories I think you can really cover enough for a full series. Yeah, I mean, I can understand The Little Mermaid having an animated series because there's a whole ocean to explore and it can be a prequel to when um, Ariel, you know, before she met with, uh, with Eric. Uh, Aladdin, I can see as a TV series because they introduced a whole bunch of villains and there's an entire, um, sec there's, you know, Agrabah, you can be able to explore everywhere or maybe even some parts of the world. Beauty and and if, if, if there's another more recent movie that I've always thought was deserving of an animated TV series, I would say it's Wreck-It Ralph. Oh, I agree to that. You've got just an absolutely um, unlimited world you can 
explore within the, within not just the video games, but the internet as well. And who knows, maybe this second movie could be the launching pad to a TV series. Meanwhile, a couple of my friends, they keep telling me they've got some very good, very positive things to say about the Tangled animated series that recently debuted as well. There are movies that you can expand on the stories in some way, but uh, yeah, I just don't think Beauty and the Beast was one of them. No. And I'm saying this as someone who probably thinks that Beauty and the Beast still might be Disney's greatest production ever. Yeah, and um, absolutely, you know, the animation, the story, the characters, the songs, everything. But well, maybe it's because of that is because is because the movie and the storyline was so there was such finality and its resol in its resolution. It's why I think part of the spite the the number two movie of series of all time would be Frozen, and I'm kind of tepid on this idea of creating a sequel movie to it. But that's a story for another time. Yeah, I'm sure that when we discuss about the Disney revival era, maybe we'll talk about that at uh, that's a, at some point. But um, yeah, uh, I guess overall, yeah, this is where I, I agree with you. I mean, not having seen you know Pooh's Grand Adventure. I guess this is the point in which a lot of people start to critique on the direct-to-video movies, especially since this came out in 97 and Pixar had just become hugely popular with Toy Story. So, uh, next one. Um, I want to talk about Pocahontas 2 because I actually did see that movie. Uh, yeah, basically it's a continuation of the first movie in which... Um, you know, Pocahontas and, uh, you know, she goes over to England to try to make peace with the King of England. She meets up with John Rolfe, who, if you know from history, that would be her husband-to-be. And, um, you know, we have Radcliffe, the villain from the first movie, who's trying to make it, who's trying to start an armada so that they can be able to take over Virginia and, you know, drive the savages away because it's now their land and stuff like that. And... It, you know, um, I've already talked about my thoughts on Pocahontas and the Disney Renaissance movie that I don't think it deserves the hate that it gets. I know that, um, you know, a lot of people critique it for being historically inaccurate and blah, 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 blah. And I, I mean, you, you have to understand it's a Disney movie. I don't expect it to be historically accurate. And here it's the same thing. I don't expect it to be historically accurate. Of course, you know, Pocahontas was taken to England and against her will and that she had to change her name to Rebecca for a Christian name and that she, you know, died of a disease in an early age. And I get that. I mean, they're not going to present it. But yeah, as, so, as someone who has, oh, admittedly has not seen the sequel, I, I do think that... I almost want to think that Disney thought they had to make this one in particular to try and uh, tr try and appease at least some of the people yeah. who complained about the historical inaccuracies and trying to create something that at least ended their story of Pocahontas closer to uh, to actual history that they could possibly do within the setting they all created. Like I said. I can't judge it on its own merits for right now because I haven't exactly seen it, but I can see that maybe it probably didn't end up as much as great as some people would like, but maybe they just were just trying the best they could with what they had to work with. Yeah, and there's a few scenes in the second movie that I actually like, like when um, for there there's the you know the scene in which when Pocahontas is you know getting onto the ship and she's about to leave and her best friend is um, you know telling her to not forget this land and you know she kind of like has it in her mind um, you know throughout the movie of you know what when you know she gets she she puts on the the fancy dress and she gets makeup on and she you know they change her necklace and. You know, she basically looks like a, uh, like what they think is a proper lady, not as a savage. And then, of course, you have that infamous scene in which when, you know, they bring out a bear and they start attacking it. And Pocahontas sees this as savagery and she gets arrested and put into jail. And then you have uh, John Smith and John Rolfe coming by and rescuing her. Oh, and, um, you know, spoilers, uh, you know, there's also a particular... Um, you know, scene in which, you know, they think that John Smith was dead, but, you know, he's not. But, uh, you know, th then there's, like, this weird kind of... Uh, there's a weird love triangle with, like, John Smith and John Rolfe uh, with Pocahontas. It doesn't last for very long because John Smith does know that, you know, John Rolfe loves her. And all John Smith cares about is, like, exploring and looking for new lands. And 
Um, we, I mean, you, you know, not, you know, taking into account of history. We knew that John Smith and Pocahontas weren't going to get together anyway. But, and then, of course, there's this uh, really nice scene in which when Pocahontas does confront the king again, talking about how Radcliffe was the one responsible for, um, you know, setting up Pocahontas and that he was going to, you know, start an armada behind his back. And then you have that fight scene in the ship. And yeah, there's there's some and oh the the one thing the one scene that I really do like is when uh, Pocahontas is kind of like in conflict about you know who she really is and you know what her main mission is. Her main mission is to make peace to the king so that they can be able to share the land. And you know she fears of losing herself along with the white man, and that's actually a pretty interesting scene. Um, but yeah, I, I do admit that it doesn't have the beautiful animation compared to the original, but it's not a bad follow-up. Yeah, I, I just guess, I guess you see as, as, I think that, I think Disney thought they were making this one almost out of necessity to try and appease uh, some of their critics. You want to, and I want to look at a, a one movie that probably didn't need a follow-up sequel to appease any critics, but it ended up pretty, ended up pretty darn good in my estimation. You probably would look at the Lion King two, Simba's Pride. Yes, absolutely. And I'm gonna say this as someone like, look, I admit I've I've watched Confused Matthews reviews and critiques of the original Lion King, and while it's not something I absolutely despise, I've always thought a number of his um, critiques of that original movie had a valid point. Now, he, if you don't know, if you don't know, he went on and reviewed this movie as well, and viewed it much better. And I think that's a simple, uh, 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 a much more interesting thing because the whole purpose of the movie is now we finally see, we kind of see like the, some of the flaws that Simba grew up with, and he has to deal with now that he is king, and the fact that he has to look to his his own daughter to see as someone that he can't become. He has to. He can't end up becoming the type of separatist person that Scar clearly was. He's got to be better than that if he's going to lead, be the type of leader that someone like Mufasa would be proud of. It's, it really is, I think, almost, almost one of the best stories Disney's created in some, in some time in showing how the youth of the world can be instrumental in moving that world in a better, more unified direction. Yeah, and it's actually interesting that they decided to portray, um, you know, uh, Simba's, you know, daughter, because I remember when I was a kid and, you know, there was actually a, a book that I used to read about the Lion King and um, that baby the cub that they had at the end of the movie was actually a son by the name of Copa. And I, I, I've only read, I think there was like more books, I think, but I've only read one. And it's actually pretty interesting that they decided to, um, you know, scrap an official Disney book in, in favor of making uh, Kiara a character. And she would become canon, too, because they did feature her again in The Lion Guard. And they did get Simba a son again, but his name is Kion. And uh, he's part of the Lion Guard group, very similar to like, you know, the Avengers trying to protect Pride Rock from the hyenas. Um, but... Yeah, I think that for The Lion King 2, a lot of people look fondly of this movie because, you know, very similar to how um, The Lion King was inspired by Hamlet, The Lion King 2 is inspired by Romeo and Juliet, where you have two uh, lions from different, pa from different uh, packs, and they hate each other, but the, the two are able to love each other, and they're able to bring their group together. And I actually think that it's actually pretty interesting. I mean, it gives a little bit of a insight into who Scar was and the followers that he had who believed in his leadership with uh, the hyenas. And, and I, I mean, it, and I'm also really curious about like who, you know, Kovu's father is because he looks like Scar, but they claim that he's not Scar's son, but the other two are um, Nuka and Vatani which may be his children, uh, I think. 
Uh-huh. But um, and you also see like the um, the you know the struggles that they had to go through because after after they were banished from Simba, they had to live in this termite area and they, there was like little food and no water and they're they're really miserable and they want to have Kovu become the leader of Pride Rock to avenge Scar. I think that's actually a pretty interesting story because. I, you know, uh, for somebody like Kovu, who was like raised to be evil and decides to choose his own way with Kiara helping him, and then Kiara learned from Kovu about hunting and for being confident. It, it, they, it, you know, when they have this, you know, the term throughout the movie, we are one, it, it matches really, really well. And not to mention when Kiara struggles to being, you know, the follower, to, um, you know, basically being like the next, you know, step towards being the the queen of Pride Rock, not being as good as her father and her grandfather were. And I actually think that that's pretty interesting. And the music in, you know, unlike most of the movies, it actually does really well. I think even one of the songs was actually going to be in the original Lion King, but they cut it for, you know, for time constraints and for, you know, fit, fitting a certain amount of songs in the soundtrack. Yeah, it definitely, it's, it's, it's definitely one of those movies where they really saw, I think they really saw that there is an extra story that can be followed up on with how the original conclusion was that can be used to almost expand on the storyline of trying to bring people together in unity. If there's another movie, I think at least they tried it, but I don't know if it succeeded enough. I know I'm skipping ahead here because we get into some of the, now we get into some of the movies I haven't seen in any way, shape, or form, but obviously we got to get to one that's probably very close for the two of us to talk about with what we've reviewed before, and that's The Little Mermaid 2 Return to the Sea. Yeah, my god, that movie. I, I, <laughs> saw, I saw it again recently, and my god, I, I, I mean, it does kind of feel like a major rehash to the first movie. I mean, almost like beat for beat, it's like the first movie ex- again, except in reverse. Instead of Ariel wanting to know more about the world and the surface, we have Melody, her daughter, who wants to learn more about the ocean because she feels so connected to it. And then we have Ursula's crazy sister. <laughs> it's, oh, it's so bad. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, you know, it's almost like you could see what they were going with this, but they would show that how... Ariel, as a grown-up, could be in danger of adapting the same type of paranoia that her father, Triton, had. But, yeah, they just went really too... I think, yeah, it ended up being just way too close to the original storyline that it, 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 it ended up becoming... This, this is probably the first Disney sequel movie that really suffers from the infamous sequel-itis, where it looks like it's just... Um, uh, just a photocopy of the original storyline, and this is where things really kind of, kind of uh, d- drop off in that cat in that area. Yeah, and uh, and here's the thing: I can completely understand Simba being overprotective of his daughter about, especially with all the stuff that he went through. He thought that he killed his father with the stampede. He was in exile for many years, being raised by Timon and Pumbaa. He was attacked by the hyenas. He was almost killed by his uncle. And the fact that his uncle had followers in another part of, you know, the, of the savanna, and they could attack, you know, Kiara, then, yeah, I would be really protective of my child, too, if that were to be the case. Simba being overprotective of Kiara is very understandable. Uh, but, yeah, I guess it definitely was uh, a, something... I also want to say this was a movie that... It could have worked had they tried to put more effort into making it more separate from a different storyline from the original, but it just didn't pull off into that. The was that, that there's another movie that, that, that was, was released later. It's I think it almost suffers from the same difficulty, but they did try in some ways to make it different from the original in some ways. And we're going to bounce around again on this because we might as well get to talk about the other two um, Disney Toon movies that got a theatrical release, starting with Return to Neverland. Okay, so I've never seen this movie. I only know bits and pieces of it, like 
It focuses on Wendy's daughter, Jane, and Captain Hook confused her for Wendy, and so she was kidnapped and brought over to Neverland, but that's all I know about. I want to say I did see this in theater. Like I have seen it at least once. It it yeah, it forwards. Obviously, in this time period, yeah, Wendy has grown up and had a daughter, and unfortunately, is ha- who is having to grow up during World War II. Oh damn! And, <laughs> and because, yeah, and that's very key because because of this, Wendy's daughter doesn't have quite the positive idealism that her mother grew up with at her age. So he has, she has trouble, um, she has, basically has trouble, you know, thinking happy thoughts, more or less, for lack of a better term. And so that's when, yeah, it's, it's apparently in this point in time, and who knows how time varies between the two worlds, that Captain Hook is able to cross over into this world and try to kidnap Wendy, obviously in the hopes of luring in Peter, but he gets his do- gets Wendy's daughter instead. And and Ian, I want to say her name is Jane. I think uh, it's it Jane. Name. Jane. It, it it escapes me. The exact name escapes me because it um, hasn't been. Her, a, um, her name is Jane. Yeah, since I've seen this, but she gets uh it, she gets taken in the is a pagan to Neverland and falls in with the Lost Boys, and it's actually the storyline. It, it's almost kind of like Disney's own version of Hook, more or less. There's some elements that are very similar to it, in which I think Captain Hook uh, tries to convince Wendy that he can, can convince Jane that he can help her get home if she'll help him bring Peter, and it ends up she having to make a decision between helping Peter or Captain Hook. One thing that's kind of frustrated me is that they, for whatever reason, they get rid of the crocodile in this movie and replace him with a giant octopus. What? But now that yes, this is the, this is now the creature that is pursuing Captain Hook for reasons I have no, I don't even remember. I mean, it's hinted that Hook got rid of the crocodile one way or the other. Yeah, but now this giant octopus is coming after him. Maybe it was a squid. I can't remember exactly, but it's one where there. Are, I think they tried to make some differences, tried to um, uh, go deeper into the storyline, but. It's kind of a jumbled mishmash, so to speak, and it's it's not terrible, but it does still kind of, uh, but it's not among one of the best, I would say. Mm. I mean, maybe you might check it out for a peak of curiosity, perhaps. But then, of course, there's the other um, theatrical sequel movie, which was The Jungle Book 2. Yeah, I've uh, heard about this one. Uh, in fact... I really recommend that you guys listen to the Animated Anarchy podcast discussion of the ju- the Jungle Book too because it's a riot. But the the only thing I I've never seen this movie. The only thing I do know about it was their discussion of the movie that basically it just tries to um you know remind people of what the original was. It has you know the old characters back and they try to you know have the same songs in the movie, but then they have to try to make a mixture of it and also um. You know, they actually did have a different, um, uh, they didn't have King Louis this time, they had a different king, and the reason- Actually, no, no, the what, naturally, the King Louis, there is no of, of that in, in this particular movie. I mean, yeah, there was a King Larry in the, um, House's Mouse sequel yes. shows, but no, there is no King Louis or any replacement in this one, likely because of that infamous lawsuit that Louis Prima's family launched against Disney because of just how- damn well Jim Cummings duplicated Prima's voice for Louie in the Tailspin TV series. Because that was a whole uh, mess there. This is one movie where, you know what, I want to think, I think that for those not aware, there was a third movie planned. Really? From what I heard, I don't know all the details, but this is the thing where it kind of disappoints, why it's kind of disappointing that this thing didn't do as well. Supposedly, the plot was going to was centered on Shere Khan getting captured by man, and Mowgli and his friends, for whatever one reason or another, they have to rescue him. And it's because of that that Shere Khan is able to make peace in accepting that not all of humans out there were out to kill and hunt him. That's kind of an interesting thing, though. I almost kind of wish that they had thought to add some of that 
into the second movie because unfortunately the the second movie didn't perform as well as they hoped that yeah the third movie got scrapped unfortunately yeah in fact i did hear a couple of other uh, directed video movies that were scrapped i remember a few years ago i saw a youtube video of the makings of dumbo 2 yeah i'm very glad that one didn't end up uh getting off the ground i'm already got reservations about this live action dumbo movie which might be the subject for a whole other video yeah. um as far, yeah as far as the other director video sequels go among the ones that i actually have seen i will confess right now and i sometimes still wonder what the hell was i thinking in doing so i have seen cinderella 2 oh, and man. it looks like and it looks like this was it's like i think they wanted that to be a tv series as well but they end up following, falling through, and they just um, mash together three potential episode storylines into one movie. And yeah, it's this is probably I would say this is probably the most throwaway movie, at least as far as the ones that I've watched. Maybe there's some. I mean, you can say what you want. No people didn't like the stories of Mulan two or Tarzan two and whatnot. But oh well, maybe Tarzan two is more like that because I don't remember trying to see it, but. The, at least those had their own um, try to conflicts and storylines. But these were these were just. I hate to use this term because there's one viewer of mine that really hates that I get too um, I too get excessively um, critical of it. But they almost come off like fan fiction stories, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Uh, and again, nothing wrong against fan fiction writers. You you like what, writing that stuff? Good for you. It's a good. It's probably a good way to help um, increase creativity. But what works for a fanfic doesn't always work in canon. And I kind of think that's kind of what the result of what happened in in that movie. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so Cinderella two, I did see it once, like on the Disney Channel a few years ago. And the only thing I remember of it was that you have Cinderella trying to modernize the traditional ways of the castle and everybody is like against her. And I think that Jacques turns into human and Anastasia. Yeah, um, I will say, if there's any one good thing that came out of the second Cinderella movie, it was showing one of the ugly stepsisters, Anastasia, I believe it was, as having a slightly better personality and that shows that may have been more to her. And obviously that was used as a stepping stone into what that character ultimately does in the third Cinderella movie, was from what I've heard. Yeah. That she, had, she ends up having a huge face turn, sorry I used that term again. But, uh, but yeah, it, it, there were at least... Uh, again, yeah, the stories they had were almost throwaway stories, but at least they were able to take some of those and push them forward into the net, into the third movie, which ended up getting a much better reception. And from what I've heard, ha has been regarded at least w one of the better of these direct-to-video sequel movies. Yeah, and I've never seen that movie either, so I, I can't really say too much about it. The only thing I know about it is the premise about, like, you know, the evil stepmother taking the fairy godmother's wand and reverts everything back in time, and uh, Anastasia ends up wearing the glass slipper, and Cinderella is, you know, uh, you know, doesn't get married to the prince, and... Yeah, that's all I know about it. Everything else, I don't know about the plot. I don't know about what happens, but I did hear about some good things on it. So, who knows? Maybe I will watch it in the future. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'll see the next movie that came after that. This was another example of... This is one of those movies that I kind of think Disney felt they had no choice into making and ended up regretting it as a result was The Hunchback of Notre Dame 2. Oh, my God. Because yeah. I look at this story and I, I'm more or less... This to me looks like um, Disney's response to everyone who was disappointed that Quasimodo didn't get the girl in the end of the first movie. Have I ever read the book? At least he lives in the end. Yeah, he yeah. Dies. We, we've, we've talked about that all in detail. So, but I do get the fact that this was their way of trying to appease to those individuals in, in saying, okay, we'll get, we'll create a new character that could become Quasi's love interest in, in the end. And yeah, but yeah, that one, this one's been covered a lot. I mean, when 
if when you consider it's the one Disney sequel movie that Mr. Enter dared to go after, that pretty much tells you just how bad this thing can get. I guess so. I mean, the fact that the whole movie is about Quasimodo getting a girlfriend, I mean, that's not really much of a strong plot point. And, the, you know, uh, the whole thing about, like, stealing um, La Fidel, which is this beautiful belle in Notre Dame, it's like, it kind of pales in comparison to a guy who was against gypsies and thinks of them as witches and tries to have them burned at the stake. It's like, yeah. Ugh. Yeah, that's probably the, that's probably, this is probably the one movie that suffered the most from uh, ha- ha- having to be much lower in quality as far as everything, as far as animation, characterization, and storyline, compared to just the, the risks they took with the first movie. Because remember, I grew up when that first movie was released, and it caught a ton of flack. For some of the stuff they tried to do in that movie, and just but just whether you, whether you think like, it was worth it, it was a good idea for them to try it or not. Obviously, the sequel, it, yeah, it goes a, a lot less. It's a lot, a lot less, less softer. Yeah, and that's a shame too. A lot because of I mean, I remember when I saw that movie in theaters, and I actually owned the book of the Disney version of Notre Dame, which you know Jaime too had once said, you know, it's uh, literature inbreeding. Which yeah, it's true, but. <laughs> Um, I, I, you, I, when you look back on that movie, you really do appreciate the risks that it took, the, um, the style of the storytelling, and you know the, um, the, the way that they were able to talk about religion and lust and all that stuff. It's, it's, you know, I, I mean, it's a risk that Disney, I doubt, will probably ever do again, but. Yeah, it's true that the second movie is a much more watered down, softer movie that the whole purpose of is for the fans who were disappointed that Quasimodo didn't get a girlfriend, now he does. But, yeah, I think that, for the most part, yeah, that movie is not very good. Uh, let me see if I can think of anything else. Um, oh yeah, uh, the movie that I did, did actually see in theaters, uh, I actually saw the Tigger movie in theater, because my cousin was a huge Winnie the Pooh fan as a kid, and her favorite character was Tigger. So that was the only, you know, movie of the Winnie the Pooh um, series I did get to see. So I the, the movie is essentially focusing on Tigger, and he's trying to, you know, as usual, go to everybody and try to see if he can play with them or hang out with them, but everybody pretty much says no. And, you know, Rue is the only one who wants to play with Tigger and hang out with Tigger. And and then Tigger, you know, he's always talking about, like, the, the most wonderful thing about Tiggers is that I'm the only one. And in this movie, he tries to see if there's any other Tiggers around because because nobody else wants to play with him. He wants to see if he can find other Tiggers that he can be able to play with. But, you know, as mentioned in the song that he always sings, he's the only one. And he starts getting really sad. And so the rest of the gang decide, hey, why don't we just throw a party to Tigger and we're going to pretend that we're actually Tigger's family. And so they'd actually disguise themselves as, you know, Tigger's. And Tigger actually thinks that that is his real family. And then he finds out that it's all a lie and he becomes really, really sad. It gets really depressing, (laughs) to be quite honest. But it does end in a very happy note that even though that they're not Tiggers, they'll always be his family. Which I actually thought that was a really sweet uh, moral to the story. Yeah, definitely. Like I said, I unfortunately have not watched any of the other Winnie the Pooh movies, but I have heard... This is probably the one I've heard the most about, and it definitely seems to have a very... um, uplifting story about you know friendship and who your real family ultimately is and maybe this one i probably should check out because you know, like i said i played eeyore in that old theater production while my sister actually played tigger so maybe that's one we ought we ought to check out yeah I got, definitely you should definitely check it out yeah like i said almost none of these other movies up to uh of the especially as, well as the sequel movies go i have to confess i ever saw the only ones that I've, the Disney Toon movie since then that I've actually seen out of just because it kind of piqued my curiosity, I'm fairly willing to admit are the Tinkerbell Bell movies. Okay, this so is- I'm only going to discuss briefly about the other movies that I did see because after that I have not seen the rest. Okay. Very well. 
All right, so I did see an extremely goofy movie. Uh, I remember because I loved the original so much, I decided to give this one a shot. And this one focuses on Max and his friends. They're 18 years old and they're off to college. And Goofy doesn't know what to do anymore because, you know, he's always been focusing on taking care of Max. And so he loses his job and he ends up going back to college so that he can be able to get himself a degree because he never got a college degree. And he basically, as usual, tries to be like his usual goofy self and Max gets embarrassed and he tries to sign up for the College X Games, which, you know, this was around the time in which skateboarding was super popular. So uh, the, basically the whole, you know, part of the story is that, you know, Goofy starts falling in love with a librarian named Miss Marple and, um, you know, he's trying to focus on his studies and then you have Max. Um, having a huge competition with uh, one of the leaders of the fraternities who have pretty much won like five, um, um, you know, five events. Uh, they, they won five years in a row in the X Games and they won to take down his rule. And, you know, um, Goofy, un, you know, kind of like had Goofy decide, um, Max uh, convinces Goofy to sign up to the, the, um, to the fraternity and he ends up performing like unquestioned, he, he, he performs well, but in a way that's cheating because they, you know, the, um, some of the members of the, um, of the group decide to put uh, rockets into a skateboard and he looks like he's performing well. And, you know, they're cheering more for Goofy as opposed to Max and, then the the competition becomes really serious, and the movie just ends up uh, and ends with the the college X Games. And yeah, this one doesn't hold up as well compared to the original movie because it just I mean, while the original movie you can argue has a bit of a '90s feel with um, you know power line and you know the way that the characters act and stuff like that, but I think that this movie is a little bit more dated with you know the skateboarding craze and. Uh, one of the characters is a uh, beatnik and there's like a coffee shop scene and um you know the, 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 a lot of the focus is on the x games and there are some you know moments in the and there's a lot of music from the 70s that are played because you know because uh, goofy and uh, miss marple grew up in the 70s era you know there's a lot of like music from the 70s that are featured like uh like there's see there's um shake your groove thing and um, knock on wood and stand out. No, no, um, well, something like that. But yeah, um, oh, make you happy. That's what it was. Yeah, make you happy. So it has a lot more 70s songs in it. And, uh, you know, in the original movie, it has more of an, uh, a more original soundtrack. So I take it that that's what dates the movie a little bit. Now, I, um, the movie is fine for what it is, and it's a nice follow up to, um, you know, the, uh, a goofy movie. And, um, it tries to, you know, tie itself together with, you know, Max not being a little kid anymore and Goofy trying to do everything that he can so he can get closer to him so they can stay a family. But Max wants to move on with his life. And um, that does tie itself nicely in the end, but that's not the main focus compared to the first movie. For what it is, it's fine. I just prefer the original more. Um, let me see if I can think of anything else that I saw. Um, okay, so I did see Tarzan 2. Um, no, no, I saw, no, I saw, yeah, Tarzan 2, and I saw Tarzan and Jane. Tarzan and Jane is supposed to be a sequel to, um, you know, the original Tarzan movie, and I think this was supposed to be the pilot to the Tarzan TV series that we would get on the Disney Channel. And once again, very similar to uh, Beauty and the Beast, that it has three different stories of Tarzan, you know, talking about like their year in the jungle because the focus of the movie is that it's Tarzan and Jane's one year anniversary. And it focuses on like, you know, Tarzan's adventures in the jungle about one of them, you know, you have uh, Jane's friends uh, going into Africa, convincing her to come home. And you have this like handsome pilot who tries to flirt with Jane. Another one is about like this um, animal that tries to... Um, and take over the jungle or something like that. So, yeah, it's just basically like three episodes compiled together. And then you have, you know, Tarzan trying to, you know, present himself really well for Jane. He puts on his father's suit from the original movie. He finds a, a ring and he presents it to her. And that's pretty much everything I remember about it. And uh, Tarzan 2 is the mid-quill. It focuses on Tarzan when he is a little kid that we saw in the first half of the first movie. And you have this curmudgeon who's voiced by George Carlin, and you have these 
um, you have these villains who's uh, a gorilla with her two sons, and it's, um, yeah, I'm not really too crazy about that one either, and that's supposed to be the midquel, that's supposed to be like, um, I don't know, I mean, if that's supposed to be like the part of the TV series, or maybe that's supposed to be, I don't even know what this movie is, I know it's supposed to be a midquel, but I have no idea what purpose this movie has. Mm hmm uh, let me see if I've seen anything else. Um, just look through the list. Um, oh yeah, Ariel's Beginning. Okay, now I can talk about this movie because, like I said, I've never seen anything else. So, uh, I mean, I guess this is supposed to be like Disney Toon's version of a prequel to The Little Mermaid, not counting the, the animated series, which we already got him. So, Ariel's mother dies from a ship crash, and her father decides... Um, Triton, King Triton decides that he's going to forbid singing because his wife loved singing and singing made the entire kingdom happy. So singing is forbidden. And Ariel um, loves singing and she doesn't understand on why that singing is banned. And there's this... Um, there's this maid who's with, um, you know, Ariel and the rest of the girls. And we do get to see who the rest of the sisters are, but their personalities don't match with what the TV series is. I think only three out of the seven, you know, not counting, yeah, counting Ariel, that only get a bit of attention. And their personalities are way different from the TV series. And... Uh, there's this um, governess, but yeah, the governess, that's who, that's who she is. So Marina Del Rey is trying to take over the kingdom. She tries to find a way that she can be able to take Triton's crown and his scepter so that she can be able to rule. And with her purple colors, I was thinking, ooh, maybe she's the one who turns into Ursula at the end. Because think about it, she wants to take over the kingdom. She's, you know, always jealous of Triton. She feels like that she's under appreciated she's purple she controls um uh she controls uh, um, uh you know animals and she even controls electric eels so you would think that maybe this would be you know the origins of ursula but no she's a completely different character she's not ursula and that's a major disappointment and uh as for the music uh this is where yeah you know this is where she first meets up with flounder and flounder um, and his friends know where there's a secret club where singing, where they have, you know, singing and Sebastian is like the leader of um, the group and he starts singing um, Congo music. One of them was, you know, jumping, uh, jumping the line and I'm like, why are they singing jumping the line? I'm expecting, you know, that scene in Beetlejuice in which Lydia and the rest of the football players who died in the plane crash are going to be like dancing to it. It was just so weird. So basically, basically this whole, this whole entire movie is Disney's version of Footloose. Yes, this is, yeah, basically, yeah, yeah, this is Disney's version of Footloose, except instead of dancing, it's singing. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, I think uh, just a look hearing about this movie kind of talks about how the Little Mermaid franchise in, in particular seems to be very loose with its continuity between entities, because like I said, um, I haven't seen this movie yet. I have seen the stage theatric, the, the stage musical remake of the original movie. And it's got some different things where, I can tell you this, in the stage version, they more or less make it clear that Ursula was the one who killed Ariel's mother. And obviously, in this se in this prequel movie, it at least it's it's not, it's not that's not, it's not suggested that she was the one that did it. No, I mean, like, in, in, yeah, in the in the prequel movie, she was killed by a ship, which really I will say this makes more sense as to perhaps uh, uh, explaining where Triton's fear of the humans would come from. I gotta give it that much credit. Sure. And, you know, if, if they would have made Marina Del Rey Ursula at the end of the movie, that would have been a great origin story for Ursula because it's there. The purple colors, the fact that she wants to take over the kingdom, the fact that she has electric eels. I mean, I just don't understand why they didn't make her Ursula. I, I don't know why. I, I guess they wanted her to be like a standalone villain. But the fact that this is a prequel would have been a great opportunity for maybe King Triton to banish her and maybe transform her into an ugly sea hag. And, 
Um, then Ursula is planning her revenge, and then eventually that would lead up to the first movie. I think that would have been a great idea. But no, the, the movie is nothing really that special. It's just, like you said, footloose. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess they just the Disney 2 Studios didn't have the big picture thought in mind like a Marvel Studios has now. Yeah. And this would been this would be the last um Disney Toons direct to video movie based off of one of Disney's um you know theatrical movies because after this this is when they started focusing on the Tinkerbell movies. And then I will admit just uh my curiosity piqued me into um watching a, a few of these that I mean, they're cute, I guess, in their own way. They kind of, if there's a word that I could say it. Obviously, they're trying to focus on uh, a character that was more or less an ensemble dark horse from the original Peter Pan movies and trying to give her more of a personality and try to explain where she comes from. If there's any movie I would recommend seeing, it would probably be the Pirate Fairy movie, just because of... Let's just say, let's just say how it ends is pretty is, is pretty uh, is a pretty funny shout out to um, the upcoming movies. The only thing that kind of disappoint, and I will say this, the one thing that kind of disappoints me the fact that the studio has been shut down is that it might mean this um, movie series gets uh, pro- has more or less been tabled, which means we won't we have yet to get perhaps the final movie where Tinkerbell meets Peter Pan. That was kind of what I was kind of looking forward to seeing eventually down the lines. And who knows what's going to happen right now. It is stuff what's worth. This was something Disney was really committed to because they they made the Disney fairies an attraction at the Disney parks. I mean, we probably didn't see it, but I know Disneyland in California has its own Pixie Hollow now where they, they have photo opportunities with Tinkerbell and the other fairies. So... This was something they really had um, some commitment to. I am curious to see where it's going to go now that the studio has been shuttered. Yeah, and from what I read, the day that the studio was shut down was that they were working on doing a, a planes movie. You know, those movies that try to cash on the popularity of cars, except that there were two that had been released as well. It's like everything. Yeah, there was like three, two planes movies released in between this whole series of Tinkerbell movies. Yes. So they were going to make a third Planes movie, but it was scrapped because the, the studio shut down. And um, we don't know what's going to happen for either the Planes movies or for Tinkerbell, for, but for as far as we know, that's pretty much the last bit of it. I think that because Disney is doing so well financially with you know, Star Wars, Marvel, and with um, their own theatrical movies. I think that Disney Toon Studios was kind of like something that they just didn't need anymore. Perhaps. I mean, I, I, if anything, I would hope that this is going to mean there's that might be getting more, um, more focus on expanding further with the main Walt Disney Animated Studios, which is kind of... It, it, it's, I'll just say things have slowed a bit. Obviously, with the fact that they had to table the production of Gigantic, and about the only releases they've got planned so far were seem to be Wreck-It Ralph 2 and Frozen 2. Hopefully, the one um, one effect of taking of, of shutting down Disney Tunes was if there's going to be more effort and resources put in back to Walt Disney Animation Studios that they can go back to creating more movies from that studio obviously they're gonna if it means taking their time and doing so so they're of good quality so be it but hopefully it's going to mean this they're moving more in that direction one way or the other yeah that's true so as of right now the future is um not certain about what it's going to be but i'm actually really curious as to uh, what's going to happen I don't know whether they're going to open up a new studio with movies. I don't know if they're going to just, you know, scrap that in favor of focusing on the franchises they have, you know, the rights to. It it has yet to be determined. So, in the meantime, you know, there have been, um, you know, looking back on all of these movies, yeah, you know, for what they are, you know, you might call them just lazy cash grabs in a time in which when Disney was not doing very well, they were being upstaged by DreamWorks and Pixar. 
but I think that for the handful of them that turned out to be okay, I think that they should get at least a little bit of credit than what everybody seems to make it out to be. It's definitely an issue where you know you try to f have to find the, the the rare diamonds within all the dirty coal, so to speak, if for lack of a better uh, term. But yeah, just for the the few um, the few bright spots that they that managed to get produced from the studio, the best you could do is just try to get the word out to people about them to try to encourage them to check them out as best as possible. Sure. All right, I think that we can wrap things up. So Chris, once again, thank you so much for coming on by. Absolutely. Uh, so please, um, please share what you have coming up. Well, I was trying to finish up, hopefully, yeah, be fin be the final uh, edition of the Ninja Turtles retrospective looking into the Nickelodeon Turtle series will hopefully be released within the next week or so. Tomorrow on, on Monday, uh, Monday the 23rd, we're recording this on Sunday the 22nd, will be the second um, review in the Summer of Marvel TV trash special we're doing. Uh, just be, be looking to wrap that up uh, if, uh, wrap that up for the next couple of months of the summer. But meanwhile, I'll be heading back out to Los Angeles to meet with Rosen and Test Zero to do some to record some re videos over there, including the next episodes for season two of Rowdy and Friends, which should hopefully be ready for debuting this coming fall. All right, fantastic! Thank you so much for listening, everybody. Uh, leave us uh, comments down below about what was your very first introduction to any of the Disney Toon Studios movies or uh, one of the directed video Disney movies. Um, which is your favorite? Which is your least favorite? What are your thoughts about the studio recently shutting down? That's it, everybody. Hope to see you around soon. Thank you for listening. Doctor, doctor, please come here quick. My big brother is awfully sick. He's got a froggy down in his throat. It's true, I heard it. He can't sing a single note.